Welcome to A Look Ahead. We are doing a series on the, the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. This series is for the first quarter of 2012 and it is entitled Glimpses of Our God. This is lesson 12 in that series from March 24 entitled Love Stories. Before we begin, would you be willing to bow your head with us and let's pray. Father, we know that you're a person of love. Help us to understand what that means more clearly as we study these love stories from Scripture as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. This lesson, of course, as you could guess already, is going to focus on the love of God. What does the expression, God is love, mean? Maybe we ought to just look at it in case you haven't looked at it for a while. 1 John 4, 8 is the familiar verse. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. And if you drop down to verse 16 in the same chapter, it says this. God is, oops, went down a little bit too far. Hold on, just give me a moment here. God is love, and those who live in love live in union with God, and God lives in union with them. So twice in that one chapter, it says, God is love. Now, some of you are going to immediately point out to me that God is love means he's talking about what word? Agape. Freedom. Agape. Oh, okay. Agape. And what does agape mean? Well, theologians will be quick to point out that the word love in that expression is agape. Agape is a kind of principle love, doing what is right because it is right, loving because that's the right thing to do. It's a loving thing to do. But is God also love in any other sense of the word? Well, is, I like to use the word value. Okay, God is but that value. has a different, a different meaning. No, it doesn't, because when you value something, you love it. Thou you shalt value the, love, the, the Lord thy God with all your heart. Mm -hmm. So value, value works very well, too, as far as... It, it doesn't have the baggage that English does with... with uh, I see. That is so true. Love is such an overused yeah. word. It's overused. It, uh, you don't know what it, exactly it means. Yeah. Does it mean sex? Does it mean, you know, there's all kinds of stuff it could mean. And when you tell somebody out loud, well, God is love, they go, well, tell me more. You know, yeah. what does that mean? Yeah. So Is God romantic? But if you use the word value, now you have to give some kind of framework in which uh, there's something brought to that because in and of itself it doesn't say whether it's good or bad some people value things that are horrible well, some people love things that are horrible too so it's the same thing they love they love drinking they love they Guns. love well they love beating up people they love i mean you can go love. that direction too yeah yeah it's all the same well, let me ask my question again. What is, is God romantic? What would that mean? Well, let, before, you, before you give an answer, let me give you some, some fodder to think about. The Bible is a kind of a history book. It's probably the only reliable history we have for hundreds, maybe thousands of years of, of history, of human history, if you start from the very beginning down to the present. It, that's a lot of history to be covered. All of that is crammed into a very short book considering how much is being covered. A human historian would probably focus on major kingdoms that ruled the world and maybe the battles they fought and the kings who were most important in those battles. Would there be any room in such a book for love stories? Song of Solomon. Well, there is in God's version of the well, Bible, but what about... They were probably involved in some of the battles. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Well, the Bible is full of love stories. Does that make God a, a romantic? Well, God presents himself all through Scripture as being in love with his people. Uh, let's just pick a couple spots. Look at Isaiah 43, verse 4. I will give up whole nations to save your life because you are precious to me and because I love you and give you honor. What does that mean? Uh, 
I hope it's not completely dumbfounding us. Look at Isaiah 62, verse 5. Like a young man taking a virgin as his bride, he who formed you will marry you. As a groom is delighted with his bride, so your God will delight in you. I mean, is that, did God really mean that? Did he really intend to say that? Or, or was that just a nice way to get us excited or something? Well, it's kind of hard for me to relate to being a bride. <laughs> Maybe you need to practice. Uh, no, they'll <laughs> accuse me of some things, I think. <laughs> well, look at, yeah. Is it a metaphor? Okay, tell me more. Well, God's trying to appeal to us in different ways, and this is one of the ways that he's trying to say how much he cares for us. Okay. Let's take the example, the, the main example of that in Scripture, the book Song of Solomon. There are people who would say that's triple X stuff. I, I'm not sure I want to go there with that when I think of love. <laughs> okay. Uh, when God chooses, I think, the, the metaphor of marriage, mm -hmm. Because in, in his mind, those are two people totally dedicated to each other. Mm -hmm. There's nothing to come in between that. And so when he says he wants to have that kind of relationship with his people, where he relates to them and they relate to him with nothing else in between, I think he's trying, that's, that's the, why he uses the marriage metaphor. Okay, and you could certainly do that, and he does in a number of places. But there's a lot of time when he gets a lot more descriptive than that. Oh, well, so. <laughs> I mean, he meets us wherever we are. I see, okay. Is God trying to suggest that true love, even sexual, romantic love, is an essential part of the binding cement that holds human families together and thus forms the foundation for human society? I don't know how far we want to go with this, but... Um, Just don't chase that very far. <laughs> I think that has been, that's being destroyed today completely. Would the modern kid know the true foundation of the family is, I don't, would they know a real marriage? I don't yeah. know. It, it's, I think it's confusing to the young folk of today. I would sure wouldn't use the word foundation with that kind of... You don't think the family is supposed to be the foundation of society? No, the family is. I'm not sure that sex is. Oh, no, but... <laughs> but it but seems like the devil attacks that so much. Yeah, he does. I mean, that's an element that he's trying to destroy how we see God by taking that and totally messing with it. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. he doesn't just go and mess with well, other things. That's the one area that he really messes with. Every aspect, every mm -hmm. aspect. Let me just read you a few verses from Isaiah, I'm sorry, from Ezekiel 16 and see how this grabs you. Ezekiel 16, the Lord spoke to me again. Mortal man, he said, point out to Jerusalem what disgusting thing she has done. Tell Jerusalem what the sovereign Lord is saying to her. You were born in the land of Canaan. Your father was an Amorite and your mother was a Hittite. Now, if you know what those groups meant in ancient times, that's not, he's not starting out with real compliments here. It's not here. complimentary. When you were born, no one cut your umbilical cord or washed you or rubbed you with salt or wrapped you in a cloth. No one took enough pity on you to do any of these things for you. When you were born, no one loved you. You were thrown out into an open field. Then I passed by and saw you squirming in your own blood. I mean, this is pretty descriptive stuff. You were covered with blood, but I wouldn't let you die. I made you grow like a healthy plant. You grew strong and tall and became a young woman. Your breasts were well formed and your hair had grown, but you were naked. As I passed by again, I saw that the time had come for you to fall in love. I covered your naked body with my coat and promised to love you. Yes, I made a marriage covenant with you and you became mine. And it goes on and the, the story gets uh, much more, even more graphic. I mean, how song far... Is of Solomon? No, this is Ezekiel. Ezekiel 18, oh. 16. And 23 is even wilder. Ezekiel 23. Well, I mean, you know, 
I don't know, maybe this wouldn't be triple X-rated, but it would be uh, one of those things. I mean, why is that stuff in the Bible? What is God trying to tell us about himself? How do, we, do we try to keep our Bibles away from those chapters so our kids won't discover them? Just how deeply and completely he loves his human people. As I recall, the Jewish males weren't allowed to read Song of Solomon until they were 30, 30 was it? And they hoped women wouldn't read it at all? Yeah. Or hear it, I guess. Yeah. Even. Well, that's a story of how somebody saw something of value in something that was not appreciated and not valued, to use your words, and uh, nurtured it and brought it along and made a thing of beauty, and it became a, a wonderful thing. And the woman was worried she wasn't attractive, mm -hmm. and he kept reassuring her, you're beautiful to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Jesus' first miracle was performed at a wedding. At the ending of the book of Revelation, God himself invites all of us to become his bride. We should read those verses. Look at Revelation 19, starting with verse 5. Then there came from the throne the sound of a voice, saying, Praise our God, all his servants and all people, both great and small, who have reverence for him. Then I heard what sounded like a large crowd, like the sound of a roaring waterfall, like peals of thunder, loud peals of thunder. I heard them say, Praise God for the Lord our Almighty God is King. Let us rejoice and be glad. Let us praise His greatness, for the time has come for the wedding of the Lamb, and His bride has prepared herself for it. She has been given clean, shining linen to wear. The linen is the good deeds of God's people. Then the angel said to me, Write this, Happy are those who have been invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. And the angel added, These are the true words of God. You know, we're going to be very happy in heaven because Jesus won the great controversy. Can you imagine if we were the bride of Satan, if Satan would have mm. won this thing? I mean, no wonder we're shouting hallelujah. Um, God is going to remain, uh, he, he's going to remain in control of heaven. Satan was unable to wrestle control from God. Yeah. And uh, praise I, be to Jesus for that. I think this is an evidence that that God can relate to every being in his universe as if that being were the only one mm -hmm. in the universe with him. Uh, we, we can't comprehend that. But I think that's the kind of relationship that he wants to have with us. And that mm -hmm. he, and only he as God, is, is capable of doing that with, mm. with everybody. But... Uh, that's that close, uninterfered with relationship that he, that he wants. Okay, now let's, let's, let's go a little bit deeper into the subject. We're talking about whether, we're talking about love stories here. The first, very first human story is a story of love. God created Adam and left him as a sole human being on this earth just long enough for him to realize how much he wanted companionship and needed companionship. And then God created Eve and performed the first wedding ceremony. That first Sabbath in the history of our world was not only a time of great rejoicing because of what God had accomplished in creation, but also was the beginning of a honeymoon for Adam and Eve. And the whole universe was watching. But you know, there was a problem in that Eve disobeyed God and Adam loved Eve so much that he turned from God and he, he, he entered into Eve's sin yeah. instead of loving God more than Eve. He shouldn't have loved Eve so much. Which is hard to say, but uh, he was completely enthralled in Eve to I the point... I think the answer to that is yes. He should not have loved her that much. Yeah. Well, then that means that he sinned before he actually did it. Well, well, she sinned before she actually ate it, too. Well, was it a sin for the, either one of them to wander away from the other one? Yeah. Well, this, if it was wrong. If this it was idea wrong. of uh, my daughter has recently become engaged, and uh, she and her fiance are thinking of a Friday wedding. Mm -hmm. And so I, I was reading this material, and I came back from vacation earlier today, and 
she picked us up at the airport and I said, you know, Adam and Eve were married on Friday. Mm -hmm. That's right. And their honeymoon started on Friday. Mm -hmm. Their first full day of honeymoon was Sabbath, mm -hmm. which is probably what my daughter is going to do. Yeah. Well, look at the story. That's wonderful. Revelation, I'm sorry, Genesis 2, starting with verse 21. Then the Lord God made the man fall into a deep sleep. While he was sleeping, he took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the flesh. Now, um, some of us used to be involved in a lot of surgeries, and I still work with a lot of surgeons, although I don't do surgery with them. I, I deal with them at, at the clinic level. I don't know any surgeon <laughs> that can do it as neat as God did it. You know, he just opened that flesh up and took out a rib and closed it up, and Adam didn't know anything had happened. Now, do men have all their ribs today? Yes, they do. Okay, so I'm somehow sorry, Adam didn't miss that rib on one side no. of him? It probably was there after he was uh, created. He probably grew a new one. Mm -hmm. He formed a woman out of the rib and brought her to him. Then the man said, at last, here is one of my own kind, bone taken from my bone and flesh from my flesh. Woman is her name because she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united with his wife, and they become one. The man and the woman were both naked, but they were not embarrassed. If he was in a deep sleep, how did he know that? Know what? That that was bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. I think God probably told him <laughs> exactly how she was created. Yeah. Maybe he felt something in his side, and that was proof. <laughs> Well, well, an anesthesiologist friend of mine says that, uh, you know, it's usually said that God was a surgeon. Well, before God was a surgeon, he was an anesthesiologist. Very an good one. <laughs> yeah. Well, why do you think God chose to make Adam and Eve that way? Did, well, he, did he, yeah? Adam was the, supposed to be the representative from this earth. Um, Adam and Eve were not representatives, but Eve was made from Adam, and then Adam was to be the representative in God's counsel from this earth, right? So it put Eve in a position of, no, you're not the representative, but Adam is. Well, well, you could, you, could yeah. just, you could just try to imagine if God would have created Adam and created Eve separately, the meaning would be different if he would have done that, and that may answer the question right there, you know, what's the difference well, in the meaning? Let, let me jokingly suggest something a little different. We see in the plan of creation that God started out very simple, although even light is not simple, and gradually made more and more, and each built on the more and more, getting more and more complicated and more sophisticated. So if Eve was made after Adam, she should be even better, right? Bad so, logic. bad. <laughs> You've been trained by your wife, Will. Well, the, uh, <laughs> it, it's been jokingly said, probably by some woman, God took one good look at Adam and said, that, that's a good job, but I can do better than that. And then he created woman, no? <laughs> and then he created woman. Well, there, Ellen White has told us that human beings are a new and distinct order. What do you think that means? That's in Review and Herald, February 11, 1902. Uh, it's also in Volume 1 of the Bible Commentary, page 1081, and in Sons and Daughters of God, page 7.2, if you want to look it up. A new and distinct order of beings. Well, there must be something different about them than any other being that has been What created. would that be? Yeah, it could be a lot of creates. things, uh, but I'm sure you've got a big one. Well, the context <laughs> is clearly this. We have the ability to do something that, not, that even Satan cannot do. We can procreate. Well, I think what would make Satan mad is the birds can procreate, the bees can, the fish can, everybody can, but he can't. Yep. And so uh, maybe it's even just... Even the germs can. Yeah, yeah. everything so in I this... Don't know. <laughs> we, are, I don't know. we are a procreating world. Mm -hmm. But we don't have any knowledge of whether any of the other creatures in all the other worlds have ha ever had that ability. Well, in the, right, the quotation from Ellen White would, simply, would certainly suggest that's not true. That's true. Yeah. yeah. Well, God has made us male and female. Well, and that, but that means that there are a set of joys mm -hmm. 
yeah, that, exactly. that, that can result from this. There are a set of headaches and sorrows yeah. that can only come from that kind of a, of a union. And so in that sense, we have an opportunity to have experiences that God has had mm -hmm. that no other creature has had. Yeah. Now, and will this continue into heaven? Will we enter as God's procreative creatures into heaven? That is a good question, and there's no place in Scripture or, or the writings of Ellen White, as far as I know, that it definitively answers that question. There are verses that sort of hint one way or the other, and people speculate, and, but there's no definitive answer. Well, Jesus did make a comment about what we're going to be a ways from now, I mean a long time from now. Yeah. Remember when he talked about the... The angels. The angels, yeah, but he talked about when, when this person gets resurrected and the, the old wife comes up, or the, the old husband, he, he's got seven husbands, now what, where, what's going to happen with that? And he explained it by, we're going to be like the angels, that that's a moot point. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that is, that's the biggest indicator of what's going to happen than, than anything. Well, there's, there's a couple things that we need to learn from this. Norm has already suggested that God didn't, God, there are lots of ways God could have given us a procreative power without connecting with all the loves and joys and emotional responses that are there for us as human beings. He didn't have to put all those things in there. Mm -hmm. um, why did God do that? I mean, you know, there's, there, are, there are small creatures that, that reproduce just by splitting in half. There, there are creatures who reproduce uh, just about, it's unimaginable almost, the different types of reproductive processes that are here still on planet Earth, which God could have given us any kind of a way. I mean, artificial insemination, I mean, whatever. But what we see is that Adam's first response upon seeing Eve was a love poem. And God inspired Moses to give the formula for a successful marriage right there. He said, you know, this is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united with his wife, and they become one. Now, I would ask you this question. Did Adam and Eve hear those words? Did they have any idea what a father and a mother were? No. They never heard of a father and a mother. They might have heard of it in the animal kingdom. Possibly. Or God and the angels might have talked to them about it, but they hadn't experienced it no. themselves. Yeah. So, Moses was commenting later about something that he believed was a, a, an essential divine truth. Yes. Well, I was just going to take that, that kind of marriage thing that they leave father and mother and become one. Mm -hmm. uh, that would, if we take that to the marriage supper of the Lamb, mm -hmm. then we leave father, mother, wife, children, everything, and become one with Him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and why do you suppose, I've had people ask me this in more primitive societies where I worked in Africa for many years, why does it say the man is supposed to leave his father and mother, but it doesn't say anything about the woman leaving her father and mother? It was the practice Doesn't of the day the that man, the woman left. The hmm? man leaves. It was the practice of the day that the woman left. It and wasn't still in many it, it parts wasn't of the, the world. practice of the day that the man necessarily yeah. left. Yep. Yeah. It tends to be that way in many of the more primitive societies of the world. The woman is expected to leave her family and join the man's family, and God says the man needs to leave too. If you're going to have a, a the two becoming one flesh and really a, a family which can respond as husband and wife to God's guidance in their family, they need to be somewhat separated from either set of parents. And not be distracted by what was before. Yeah. Well, also so that uh, the man can be the head of the household instead mm -hmm. of the man's mother being mm -hmm. the head of the household mm -hmm. or the man's father. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, after God created Adam and Eve without any artificial coverings of any sort, they were naked. We already read that verse. Is this to suggest God's intention that under ideal circumstances we are to experience these, experience intense closeness and intimacy between husbands and wives? Seems to suggest that, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. 
considering how Satan has abused the idea of sex, we've already just hinted at that a little bit, it may be hard for us to remember that in the beginning, God invented sex. Do you think God delighted in watching Adam and Eve react to each other? I mean, nobody, as far as we know, this had never happened in the history of the universe so far. This is a brand new experience. I think the whole universe was watching. Oh, and that's you, a bad thought. <laughs> a bad thought? What? <laughs> well, maybe Do you not think Adam, bad, but pretty... Um, <laughs> yeah. What's the word? Was the story of Adam and Eve one of a perpetual honeymoon? Now, do any, do any churches teach a different scenario about Adam and yes. Eve and God? Um, God did not create sex, but they messed around, and that was the sin versus the apple and yes. the tree of good. And yes. Because that's what I heard. And mm -hmm. There's the churches, that, many churches that teach that, or used to teach that, not so many anymore that openly teach that. There's also churches that teach that, um, you know, that the Adam and Eve sin was a way of separating themselves from God, just as the, father and the, the, the man is supposed to leave his father and mother. Adam had to leave God and sin so that later he can rise to a higher status mm -hmm. to become the head of his own world. Mm -hmm. well, well, was that same organization says that God told Adam and Eve to sin. Because mm -hmm. they equate sex with sin, and so when they told him to be fruitful and multiply, he, he go out and had sin was what the implication. What was confusing to me is when I was told this um, by people who went to this church, and then I'd read in the Bible, God put him naked in the garden and says, go uh, create. And then uh, if they did that, he considered it a sin. And, you know, so... Um, you just have to read the Bible, and and God created sex. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, almost every one of the major characters in the Old Testament was involved in some kind of romance. It's recorded there. I think of the story of Abraham and Sarah, Genesis 16, of Isaac and Rebekah, Genesis 24, and even Jacob and Rachel in Genesis 29. It's interesting... Look at that story in Genesis 29. There's a very interesting bit there. Um, Jacob, he, he's traveled, remember, he's escaped from his brother, Esau. He travels hundreds of miles through the, basically, desert, through the hostile territories. Now, until, this is after he double-crossed his brother. This is after he's double-crossed his brother, and with the help of his mother, and so forth. And so he leaves his mother, and he charges off to his relatives, hoping he can find a home over there and figure out how to reconstruct his life well so he ends up over there and he comes to the place which he believes is somewhere close to where his relatives live Jacob asked the shepherds my friends where are you from from Haran they answered he answered he asked do you know Laban or Laban grandson of Nahor yes we do they answered is he well he asked he is very well they answered look here comes his daughter Rachel with his flock Jacob said, since it's still broad daylight, not yet time to bring the flocks in, why don't you water them and take them back to pasture? They answered, we can't do that until all the flocks are here and the stone has been rolled back. That we, then we will water our flocks. While Jacob was still talking to them, Rachel arrived with the flock. When Jacob saw Rachel with his uncle Laban's flock, he went to the well, rolled the stone back, and watered the sheep. Then he kissed her and began to cry for joy. He told her, I am your father's relative, son, the son of of Rebecca. Um, was it a kissing cousin? Maybe that's where that expression came from. Uh, <laughs> do we have any exa other examples of people kissing in the Bible? The only other one in the Old Testament is in Song of Solomon. Well, didn't Judas kiss Jesus? On that's the in the New Testament. Oh. And I don't think that was a romantic kiss. Do you think Jacob kissed her because he was so happy that he found his relatives? Or was he already trying to make some romantic moves? Ask him. <laughs> the context would suggest he was happy to find relatives. Jacob was probably several times older than Rebecca. She was probably quite young. He was in his 70s when this happened. 
How old did he live to be, though? 120. Okay, plus. so he was halfway through life. 120. Plus. In his prime. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, spoken like a veteran, huh? <laughs> well, although these love stories are touching, every one of them has its problems. There was Hagar in the story of Abraham. Abraham lying to Pharaoh and Abimelech about his, who his wife was, really. A Rebecca and Jacob working together to deceive Isaac. And Isaac lying to Abimelech again about his wife. There was Leah and, of course, the two concubines. So what does that teach us? I mean, is, is God having a hard time using his marriage metaphor and teaching us about his love? The devil is active in tempting them. Okay. And they're good at following him. Well, many of the most famous characters in the Old Testament had multiple wives. This raises questions in many people's minds about God's plan for marriage. In places and other places in the world where, where uh, polygamy is quite common, I mean, they got plenty of examples to look at in the Old Testament, right? Now, we can point out that Adam, I mean, we can say, well, God started out with Adam and Eve. Yeah, that's true. But what do we do about Abraham and Jacob with his four wives and David with a, a score or more and Solomon with his 1,000? God can start with any mess. <laughs> God, God can start out with any mess. Huh? Well, you know, it seems like some men accumulated great wealth and the women needed someone to support them. But how about the men who needed wives who didn't have as much money? I mean, the thing is all lopsided. Mm -hmm. um, I know in some cultures today in, in our country, they get rid of the young men so that the ruler can have more wives. I mean, it isn't right. <laughs> and they should maybe allow the men to make a living to support a wife so that everybody can have a wife. I suppose that when they had wars so many times, there was a kind of a shortage of men sometimes. Oh, there could have been a shortage of men. Yeah. So he, they made the men without any wives go out and get killed in war. <laughs> so. Well, I'm just saying. It just, no, it seems lopsided. Yeah. It, well, there are a number of verses. In, uh, well, let me just say, make one more comment. I, I spent many years in East Africa and have talked to many young people who grew up in polygamous homes. And I have never talked to anyone who thought it was a great idea. Well, it's terrible as a female. Yeah. And the kids in the African culture, the father would come around every so often, traveling from wife to wife usually, come around every so often and, and mom would tell him about all the misbehaviors of the kids and then he would whip them to within an inch of their life, it seemed to them, and pretty soon pa father was gone again and mom would be pregnant again and, and that's what they knew about their father. And often, very often, it was a case of get, being drunk while he was there and we're not, not talking about Christian marriage relationships, but uh, pretty sad, pretty sad commentary. So God's ideal is one husband and one wife forever. It sure looks like that. Like he wants to have a relation with us. Let's look at some verses that talk specifically about how God wants to relate to us. Exodus 34 verse 14. Do not worship any other God, because I, the Lord, tolerate no rivals. Now, if you have another version, uh, what version do you have, Norm? Where are you? This would be Exodus 34, verse 14. Anybody else have a different version? One of the more traditional versions? What, is, what do those more traditional verses, versions say? Where mine says, because I, the Lord, tolerate no rivals. Exodus 34, 14. We're not as fast as your computer. Sorry. <laughs> uh, you shall worship no other God, for, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Yeah. The Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. What does that mean? God wants a best Don't friend. mess with my wife. <laughs> okay. God wants the best for his family. Uh-huh. That's why I would read it. There's one that says, "Oh, I heard that God was a jealous God, and that just turned me off." Now that's that's as they don't have to read uh, ancient English. Yeah, 
what, what this means, jealous in that context, means very precious. Mm -hmm. right. God looks at us and He says, man, I like what I see. I'd, I'd like you to be my pure bride, etc. Um, that's what He's really <coughs> talking about. Well, a parent is very jealous over their their kid. Um, yeah. Get a kid involved in anything, and they're just right there protecting. Well, what about um, Deuteronomy four verse twenty four? Deuteronomy four verse twenty four. What does that say? My version says, "Because the Lord your God is like a flaming fire, He tolerates no rivals." That sounds pretty ferocious, doesn't it? Mm hmm. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Is a consuming, so God is a consuming fire like hell? Well. He will consume us? I mean. God, it's God's glory that will be ultimately at the end, the fire of hell. Yes. Depends upon one, what one thinks of hell. It understand. it, it requires a a completely different understanding of hell than what many people think. Desire of Ages has a comment Yeah. on consuming fire. So will it be in the great final day when the judgment shall fall upon the rejectors of God's grace. Christ, their rock of offense, will then appear to them as an avenging mountain, the glory of his countenance, which to the righteous his life will be to the wicked a consuming fire because of the love rejected grace despised, the sinner will be destroyed. What page is that? Desire of Ages 600. Okay, Desire of Ages 600. Yeah, put that with is, uh, Isaiah, thir excuse me, Isaiah 33, 31. 14. 33, 14, yeah. yeah. The righteous live in the fire. And it, well, it always talks about God is a fire, a consuming fire, and yet people say hell is going to be the fire. So, yeah. I mean, when we read our Bibles, we often get a different picture than when we just listen to humans. Okay, now let, let's, let's come down to where the rubber meets the road. Is it possible for us as, a human, as human beings to have a personal, private, intimate relationship with God? I've read books that make me think so. Mm -hmm. um, How would that work? We can't see Him, we can't touch Him physically. That's... That's that faith thing. Mm -hmm. That's that magic that we were talking about. <laughs> I see. He talks to us through the Bible. Mm -hmm. We talk to him in prayer. Okay. So wouldn't this be largely dependent upon our prayer, prayer experience? And Absolutely. Bible study. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I can see close, but um, there's always a human, there's always a doubt. Mm -hmm. No, I think there's always doubt. Well, someday in the new earth, will we be able to go up to, to God and give him a big hug? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I don't know why you even asked that question. Because I'm, I'm trying to make this real for people. Yeah, but you, gotta, you can't reify everything and make, to make it real. It, why not? It, it'll, it, it could it could kind of direct them off a little bit. An awful lot of people are scared to death of God. I don't want people to be scared to death of God. I want to ask, can you go up and give him a hug? I, I think that you may fall at his feet. He may pick you up and embrace you and you yeah. embrace yeah. him. I, I think I may stand off a little insecure and I think God needs to come up and love his people because after what we've been through. Mm -hmm. Well, all that could happen with Jesus. If I came up to Jesus, all that stuff you're talking about could happen to me. Well, could happen other, to anybody. Any different? No, I wouldn't be any different. But okay. but um, I don't know. When you start talking about the Father and hugging, um, there's some some questions come up in my mind. <laughs> well, let's read a few more verses. Maybe it'll 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 <laughs> take care of some of the questions. Look at Jeremiah 31, verse three. I appeared to them from far away, people of Israel. I have always loved you, so I continue to show you my constant love. Now, when is Jeremiah writing this? Isn't this during the exile? Probably, well, not quite to the it's exile yet. The exile. Probably during the siege of Jerusalem, just as things are getting really, really, really bad. God says that. And that's not all. Look at some other places. 
Look at Revelation 21, verse 9. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came to me and said, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. I mean, I don't know. I, I have a feeling that that's just about as, as friendly as, as you can get in human terms, right? But look at, look at what time in Earth's history that is. Yeah. That's the time when the plagues are falling, when the, the righteous are in little companies out in the mountains in the retarded places, and they're about to be killed by this. And, and he says, I want to introduce you to my bride. And it's that little, those little groups out there. Mm -hmm. talk, about, talk about a change in, in, in relationship and yeah. status. Well, there's one chapter that really sort of epitomizes much of what we've been talking about. It's Hosea 11. Let me read you the first eight verses of Hosea 11. The Lord says, When Israel was a child, I loved him and called him out of Egypt as my son. But the more I called to him, the more he turned away from me. My people sacrificed to Baal. They burnt incense to idols. Yet it was I, the one who taught Israel to walk. I took my people up in my arms, but they did not acknowledge that I took care of them. I drew them to me with affection and love. I picked them up and held them to my cheek. Is that worse for you than giving God a hug? Well, it's symbolic. <laughs> I mean, what? I bent I mean, down to them. All symbolic. I bent them down, bent down to them, and fed them. They refused to return to me, and so they must return to Egypt, and Assyria will rule them. War will sweep through their cities and break down the city gates. It will destroy my people because they do what they themselves think best. They insist on turning away from me. They they will cry out because of the yoke that is on them, but no one will lift it from them. How? And now God says. This is how I feel about all of that. How can I give you up, Israel? How can I abandon you? Could I ever destroy you as I did Adma, or treat you as I did Zeboim? Adma and Zeboim were two tiny little towns that were, that were uh, destroyed along with Sodom and Gomorrah. My heart will not let me do it. My love for you is too strong. I mean, how, how, how can we take that? You know, it sounds like God has to, is restrained by certain rules that maybe operate his kingdom. Mm -hmm. And when we violate these of our own free will, bad things happen to us. Mm -hmm. And God is saying, please don't do this. Please don't do that. Please do it my way. And then I can bless you. And then things will go well for you. But sort of like on a mountain, at a certain temperature, the snow melts. If we reach a certain point and we go over the line of God's rules, then we start the meltdown and God is saying, oh, please don't melt, come back. One cherry sin mm -hmm. will cut off that power from God. Well, I hope not because uh, I hope it's a little bit more. <laughs> Well, this, I'm, I mean, saying, that's I'm, saying scary. A, I'm saying a cherry sin. This is one in which I will not give up. I'm not saying a sin does because... Well, are you speaking like alcoholism or something that has a hold of you? I don't care what it is. If it's something that, God, that you are convinced that God wants you to do and you refuse to do it, you cut off his power to you. Well, you, if you get in that kind of situation, it's because you don't trust him to be right. That's exactly right. So, precisely. Well, in the Koine Greek of the New Testament, love, is in its, love in its various aspects is described by four different words. Epithumia is one. It means passion. In some contexts, it can even mean anger. Eros, which means primarily a sexual kind of love. Philia, which means brotherly or family love. And, of course, we think of the word Philadelphia, brotherly love, the city of brotherly love, and agape, which of course means a principled kind of a love, a love, a love you express because you think it's the right thing, even though that thing you're loving may be very unlovable or very not, not very attractive anyway. So out of these four choices, which would you say best describes God's love for us? Or didn't, some didn't, of all, all you, of them? Didn't you say at the beginning agape? Well, the, the verses that say God is love, 
uses the word agape. Mm -hmm. But I'm asking all the way through this lesson, we've, asking, yeah. we've been asking... But you know, I, I think when you look at what, what happened to Jesus as he was tried and crucified, that was agape love. Mm -hmm. There's no other way to talk about sexual things. There's no way about family love or anything. This was principled love that yeah. if he went through it, he could save people that he couldn't save without it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the problems in trying to understand God's love for human beings is the issue of suffering. It seems that if he truly loved us, an all-powerful God who is in control of the universe could prevent suffering. I mean, if he's all-powerful, couldn't he prevent it? Sure. For our Christian friends who do not understand the great controversy, this is a terrible conundrum. If he could, why doesn't he? But those Seventh-day Adventists who understand the great controversy and God's need for allowing us freedom, if he wants us, uh, if he wants us really to love him, understand that suffering must come as a part of the demonstration of the consequences and results of sin. Usually there's two, two effects there. One is they're suffering because of, of, of sin of some kind. But two, it's, it's that suffering, if dealt with properly, develops a greater love and a greater dependence on. And, and God can bring, a, <laughs> again, he's God, can bring a blessing out of that suffering. Look at the, look at the suffering that the people in the last hours of earth's history are going to go through. It's horrible suffering, nigh unto what Jesus went through. They just don't die. Mm -hmm. And out of that comes people that can stand next to his throne. Yeah. Sometimes I've heard um, that other denominations that have no explanation for God's suffering, but just accept that God always does what, what is right and they love him anyway, um, can actually be stronger than Adventists who have a reason for everything but whine about it. Mm. I mean, well, just, just to flat out accept that God is always doing what's right and to not question a reason is a pretty strong faith. I mean, I would like to know a reason. I, I couldn't um, um, well, I understand trust, that. I don't trust the time when, I mean, I don't trust the idea of having a reason for everything at all times. You're going to have a time when it looks like God's going to be doing bad things or he's not going to come through. And um, you just have to trust him. That's when you and have yeah, to hang on to. That's when you have to hang on. But you won't understand, you won't have a reason for everything all the time that's just i mean that's that's when it comes to god said it i believe it well let's let let's <laughs> let's move on there's some more questions what about the pleasures in life hebrews 11:25 is a famous verse you know moses there chose to suffer affliction with the people of god rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season did he consider sin the opulent lifestyle? Well, that was what I was going to ask. What, what, what kind of pleasures of sin was he, was he giving up? Did he, as a young man, I mean, in, in, promis promiscuity was widespread in, in those days. Did he, as a young man, because of his Hebrew upbringing, refuse to take a, he, uh, uh, an Egyptian wife, for example? And probably about Moses, right? Yeah. Probably uh, he was an attractive young man. I mean, he was potentially in line to be the next pharaoh. You know, all the ladies would be lining up, wouldn't they? Well, they did a big movie about Moses, and he refused to, he drove this one lady and, you know, made her very angry because he would not take yeah. an Egyptian. So. Yeah. But that was a movie's translation of it. Yeah. Well, this might suggest to your mind that anything pleasant to the body is sinful. This was a view held by Plato and others in Greek philosophy, leading to, the idea that, leading to the idea that anything that is good for the body is bad for the soul and vice versa. But look at the facts. It was God who made us capable of perceiving the incredible range of beautiful colors, for example, 
by making your eyes the way they are. I mean, God didn't have to make it possible for us to see this incredible range of beautiful colors. It was God who made it possible for us to experience the incredible variations in aroma and taste that make many aspects of the life more enjoyable, including eating. Some people enjoy it a whole lot. It was God who also gave us reproductive systems that are not just mechanical ways to produce offspring, but that are capable of very pleasant experiences for us to enjoy in the process. Furthermore, considering all that has resulted from the abuse of sex down through the generations, why did God make us like that? Would we better, be better off without the sensory pleasure connected with sex? It Wouldn't seems, God have avoided a lot of problems by doing it that way? It seems like everything that God made good, Satan has corrupted into bad. And the more it's supposed to represent God, the more Satan has been determined to destroy it. Yeah. We didn't mention this, but I, I think this is a good place to throw it in. One of the things connected with the sexual reproductive whole scene is that we end up with children. And children teach us a whole lot about God and the struggles he has in dealing with us, don't they? They sure do. All the parents I see nodding. Um, it's also important to notice, however, that human females were made with a monthly cycle and not an estrus cycle. And many animals of females become sexually attractive only when it's time to reproduce. But God made it so that we could enjoy the sensory pleasures of the sexual relationship without having to become pregnant. Which brings us back to the Song of Solomon. Through the very explicit language in this book, God is trying to tell us that the romantic and sexual relationship, which is part of marriage, at its best, when carried out following Christian principles, is exactly the kind of experience he wants to have with us. Now we know that God loves us in a principled way. Because he loved us in more than a principled way? Does he really like us as friends? That would be philia. Does he love us as a bride? Is he really happy to be with us, to spend time with us? Does he enjoy it? I, I guess you can only answer that on, on what he went through to make it possible. Mm -hmm. Do you think he'd like the results of it? He obviously paid a huge price. He sure did. Yeah. Well, do we love our children even when they're causing us pain? Yeah. Sometimes we might be tempted to whack them on the backside, but we still love them. John 15:15. 15, 15, I do not call you servants or slaves any longer because servants do not know what their master is doing instead. I call you friends, mm -hmm. because I have told you everything I heard from my Father. Yeah. So God wants us to be philia, friends. Mm -hmm. Sit down, Love let's friends. have a chat. Yeah. yeah. Every time when an angel or even God himself, Jesus himself, would appear to a human being in Scripture, we find them falling on their faces, I mean, all the way from Sinai to down through history. And God always responds by, stand up, I want to talk to you. Stand up, I want to talk to you. And then specifically, Jesus said, I want to be your friend. Well, considering the crude, licentious, and abusive ways in which sex has become a major part of our culture, we might be inclined to think that God will want us to stay away from it completely. Recent evidence suggests that children who are sexually abused in childhood are much more likely to become obese and much harder to treat for their obesity later in life because they have been abused sexually. The story of Jesus at the wedding in Cana is a familiar one to Christians, John 2, 1 to 11. Many scholars believe that this wedding was of some member of Jesus and Mary's extended family, maybe a cousin. That may be why Mary felt responsible when the wine ran, had run out. While we do not have space to discuss that issue in this lesson, there is no reason to believe that the wine which Jesus created was alcoholic. But in the extended, perhaps week-long ceremonies at such a wedding, Jesus created between 90 and 120 gallons of fantastic, tasty grape juice. I have a friend who was a chemistry teacher at a public school. Mm -hmm. 
And he taught his students, which he told me, is they went through the process of alcohol. And he says, alcohol is nothing more than yeast urine. Mm -hmm. And he says, Waste when, product. when you're drinking alcohol, you're you're drinking the urine of yeast. And I mm -hmm. thought that was a wonderful lesson for the high school students. <laughs> and he says that's why it gives you a hangover. Yeah. <laughs> well, you can be sure that the wedding guests at the Cana wedding never forgot what they had to drink. They, I'm sure, were talking about it for the rest of their lives. Well, before we try to suggest that all such places are out only for the married, we need to remember that Jesus himself never married. There is a place for singles in our church. Considering all that we have discussed so far, why did God describe the redeemed no, as... No, just a minute. You just... That's the only single. John the Baptist was single. Jeremiah was single. Yeah. Uh, Ezekiel? Ezekiel. No, no, Ezekiel lost his wife. No, was it Ezekiel or Jeremiah? Ezekiel lost his wife. Okay, so there were a lot of single people. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of single people. Well, the Bible clearly suggests that God's ideal for marriage is one man married to one woman. This is supposed to be a committed, tender, intimate, and beautiful relationship in which the man and woman each learn from the other how to be more like God. Remember that both men and women were created in the image of God. How can we convince our young people that waiting for the intimate aspects of marriage until after the wedding ceremony takes place, takes place excuse me, is always his best plan? We read Jeremiah 31.3. What kind of love is being talked about here? Will those Christians who have experienced a true, loving, Christian marriage relationship on this earth have a head start in their relationship with God? Does romance which is carried out following God's principles produce a win-win situation? What can we as a church do to teach our young people the, the wonderful experience of, of marriage and, and how to keep it sacred and enter in it into in a sacred kind of thing. There are many relationships in the Bible that were not marriage, and, but they were beautiful relations. Paul and Timothy, Naomi and Ruth, David and Jonathan. But we do need to always remember and keep in mind that love is a code word for God in the best sense. Satan's code word is always selfishness. We should all recognize that life is a string of relationships from the time where parents with children, sibling with sibling, parents, I mean, husband with wife, and so forth, and all these relationships should involve love. We hope that's been your experience. See you next week.